Hello friends, in this case I encountered a posterior capsular rent while removing the last piece and I'd like to show you how I went about managing it. But let's start from the very beginning of the case and the peculiar challenges that were presented in managing this case. This was a small pupil and in addition there was a very hard grade 4 nucleosclerotic cataract. As you know, it's imperative to stain the anterior capsule with tripen blue dye. A decision was then taken to implant a pupil dilating device, which is the Gupta ring. And let's observe how the Gupta ring is inserted in this case. With the help of little nudging from the Sinsky hook, it's easy to engage the three loops almost pretty consistently most of the times. And the fourth scroll can just be taken and dropped over the pupillary edge. Remember that if there is a certain amount of sclerosis of the pupillary edge, then you may have to stretch this pupil before inserting the Gupta ring. The capsular rexis is being fashioned so that it is at least 5.5 millimeters or even slightly larger. This large size of capsular rexis of course will greatly facilitate the management of the nucleus disassembly. It will help in mobilizing the pieces and also in emulsifying them. Although cortical cleavage hydrodissection is not strictly necessary, there is a thin sliver of a hard epinucleus shell covering this nucleosclerotic cataract and hence a gentle hydro dissection should be done at multiple points. The fluid wave of course cannot be seen and therefore you have to rely on the rise of the nucleus. This coat is then placed to coat the corneal endothelium as well as to protect it from the phaco energy as well as flying shrapnel that gets released during the process of phaco emulsification. The nucleus disassembly technique that I am employing is a direct chop technique using the paddle maneuver for separation of nuclear fragments and I expose the phaco tip to about 2 millimeters and use a steep angle of attack to drive the phaco tip through the horizontal midline of this nucleus before attempting to crack it and separate it through and through, including the posterior plate. The large mass of the nucleus and the shear forces that exist between the capsule and the large nuclear mass is the primary reason why the rotation of this nucleus of these large nuclei are usually quite difficult. It's not that you have not performed a proper cortical cleavage hydrodissection. The important thing is to achieve a breakdown of this large nucleus into sufficient smaller fragments so that it will facilitate the mobilization of the fragments through the capsular rexis and help you to bring it to the safe zone in the center and emulsify the fragments. Now once you've achieved the cracking of the fragments, always use or exchange the long chopper with a Sinsky hook. This device being much smaller is more easily maneuverable within the eye and you will not accidentally engage the nucleus and snare it while you're feeding it to the phaco tip.
The fragment removal is done by keeping the phaco tip steady in the center of the eye and applying suitable amount of phaco power. A top up of viscoat once again to coat and protect the endothelium and the procedure continues. You will notice that up till now the procedure was happening quite smoothly. In fact, there is no indication that something untoward is going to pop up quite soon. The emulsification of the fragments as well as the direct chop was achieved by using the multiburst mode of FACO which delivers the FACO energy in short packets of bursts at 100% of preset power. While the multiburst mode is very effective to break down hard nuclei, it is a much better idea to switch over to the pulse mode or the micro pulse mode because in the micro pulse mode the chamber stability is much better. I now have only the last fragment to remove and everything looks fine. The capsular excess edge looks fine. The posterior capsule is okay and there is just one small fragment to remove before I am done with the nucleus management. The mistake I made probably is because I, is that I did not switch over to micropulse mode. I continued with the multiburst mode of FACO. And I think I managed to successfully remove this piece without creating any disruption of posterior capsule. But however, when I went after this final piece, it is at this point that the phaco tip inadvertently touched the posterior capsule which in such cases tend to be extremely thin. I did not notice it while pulling the phaco probe out but while insufflating the anterior chamber with viscoelastic I noticed that something was amiss and didn't look right. And this is when I found that there was a discontinuity of the posterior capsule. The nucleus had been completely removed, cortex also has been completely removed except for a few stray bits. So what I do at this point is I try to convert this posterior capsular rent opening into a posterior capsular rexus. So I do it in two parts. First I finish the nasal portion of the rent. Now I take the temporal portion of the rent and I am able to convert this tear into a smooth oval opening in the posterior capsule. I think you can see the smooth opening there. The hyaloid phase is intact because the visco that I am injecting is not oozing out into the vitreous as it can sometimes happen. I now go ahead to implant the hydrophobic acrylic lens. And since I had successfully performed the posterior CCC, I decided to implant it directly within the capsular bag. So this is what I am trying to do. I am trying to dial the lens into the capsular bag. I thought I was successful and the lens has settled into the capsular bag till I noticed that probably the entire lens is not in the bag because of the squaring of the capsular rexus. So that particular haptic is in the bag. So all I had to do was to dial the other haptic inside the capsular bag and the lens got beautifully centered within the capsular bag. 
So once having achieved good centration of this lens, the next step is to remove the pupil dilating device and let's observe how this is done. Of course, it makes us wonder whether there is vitreous in the anterior chamber or not. So my plan was to remove the pupil dilating device first before I checked for vitreous coming out from around the pupillary edges, which I would ascertain by using intracameral diluted triamcinolone acetonide. So the viscoelastic, the OVD is removed using a Simcoe cannula because a coaxial IA cannula has a large flow volume and I did not want to displace the IOL by using a large flow. A little amount of pilocarpine is then injected to create a narrowing of the pupil. However, it did not induce much of meiosis. I think it's because of the fact that there was micro sphincter tears that were induced by the use of the pupil dilating device. And finally, triamcinolone astonide is injected into the anterior chamber and washed out, which reveals the anterior chamber to be completely free of vitreous strands, either extending to the side port incision or the main incision. The presence of a little amount of triamcinolone astonide in the anterior chamber will also have the additive effect of being anti-inflammatory. So then I hydrate the incisions and that brings the case to an end. Thank you for your attention.